welcome you back and uh, welcome you to this session. I'm really excited for the, uh, for the presentations that we have lined up and the great discussion we hope to have following the presentations. Um, <coughs> uh, as you can see in the agenda, the title of this session is First Nations and Water Governance. And uh, I'm hoping to have a diverse uh, discussion after and uh, we've got a great uh, set of panelists here that's going to provide you with some pretty good insight in terms of the different uh, perspectives experience and views on water governance from a First Nations perspective um, there's a lot of uh, underlying um, commonalities although as uh, we always talk about each watershed has its unique issues and each community has its unique issues and concerns there's a lot of underlying commonalities, especially when you speak to uh, the governance and legal framework and legal context. Uh, there's, if you look at the international scale, there's uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that uh, speaks quite clearly to the role and the rights that Indigenous people have in terms of their lands and their waters. Um, there's also the, uh, the Canadian context. You speak to about the Constitution, Section 35 rights. And here in BC, there's a number of uh, case law that has arisen over the past number of years that is really changing the face of First Nations uh, role and, and the recognition of the rights and working towards the recognition of the rights and the title um <coughs> for our land and our resources. So it, I'd really encourage all of you to really um, educate yourselves on, on that on that uh, basis, on the legal context, and and just to better understand where our, our First Nations people and governments are coming from and, and the world that they operate in. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, I guess how we'll, we'll roll this out, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about each of them, and then I'm going to ask them to come up and, and do their, their presentations and share their words with you, and then we're just going to have an open-ended discussion uh, to finish up our time. So we're going to start with, uh, with Larry George, and uh, Larry was born here in the, in the Cowichan Valley. Uh, he's a member of the Cowichan tribes. He grew up along the river and spent a lot of time traveling the river to harvest various resources. He currently holds the land and governance manager position for the Cowichan tribe and has so for the past 15 years. The lands department mandate is to monitor and protect the resources within their traditional territory and he's here today speaking on behalf of Chief William Seymour. So I'd like to welcome Larry. I noticed Chief Nessie at you. Happens that small son from Flumlets. Good morning, everyone. My name is Larry George from the Couch and Tribes. I would like to offer my appreciation to the organizers for these, this event. There's been some wonderful experiences and knowledge shared with us. And thank all of the previous speakers. I would like to share some views that the Couch and and many First Nations have on governance. When I attend meetings with our political leaders or with our elders, you know, we are reminded that there was a system, there was a very good system in place for many generations, and they begin talking about, you know, if we're talking about the watershed and the river, they remind us that, you know, we have on the Couch and River, we have Flumflumlets, Chenips, and Komiek, and Kwamets, and Hoxela, and Samana. You know, these are the villages along the river, and they continue to survive along the river. And for many generations, monitoring enforcement and control was uh, conducted by various leaders in each of these villages. The, the control 
w was there for many reasons, and I think one of the main reasons was sustainability. You know, we are fortunate, as, as, as many communities, you know, have people that can, that can have a, a vision of, you know, what to expect and what may come if, if certain things are done or not done. So, so there was a control on the harvest of various resources and even more so on access. I guess one example is that for many years there, there was a family that uh, provided um, the transportation on this river and once it was granted by the leaders only that family provided those individuals with transportation up and down this river. You know, we, we do need to talk about what was traditionally done to su sustain the land. Uh, one of the things, you know, those leaders in each of those villages, families, uh, were given the role of specific uh, responsibilities. Uh, there was the access, there was who harvested various types of resources. So, so those, those roles carried on in the family for many years and you know, if, if there was a problem, you know, the leadership would look to that family and, and, and hold them responsible. So it was very important for them to, to uh, carry on their role and make sure what was needed to be done was done correctly. It was a different system than we have today. Uh, back then, you know, we, it, it was done to sustain the resources, but also had another role and that it allowed the community to, to gather and at some point share the resources compared to today where the leading factor is economics. It's about making money I mean, there is some thought put into sustainability, sustainability, but nowhere is there enough thought put into that. You know, so, so we, we, we feel that that uh, function needs to be brought back. You know, there was, there was a purpose and it's, it allowed the resources to, to survi survive for, for many generations. You know, trying to put it into some of the terms that were raised yesterday, you know, I, I think I can say that the elders, I mean, that could be of a First Nation community, could be from any type of community, we all have elders. They are the choir. And that's, you know, the rest of us sitting here, we're the congregation. So, you know, we need to, we need to continue to s work together so that we can, uh, follow the direction that's provided by our elders. We, we as First Nations would like to uh, bring some, some different thought processes into decision making. You know, there, you know, a lot of us have grown up with um, you know, 
decisions made by strictly a, a vote, majority wins, or the strongest group or party makes the decisions. You know, th there is, you know, real true leadership that, that does listen to the community or congregation and that they take all of those thoughts and ideas and into consideration and that you know the outcome is you know really what is best for the whole what is best for the whole community you know and not what is best for one individual or person I, I do need to raise a few points about the current process. You know, we, d we do have policies in place that are, are run by various governments. And we definitely feel that what the province has in place now does, does not meet the needs of, of, of a watershed. You know, we have a lot of people that are concerned and willing to, to work to sustain watersheds. And, you know, a template policy does not address each of those watersheds. You know, all of the watersheds are unique, require different uh, things to be done to make it sustainable and healthy. And the people that best know that, you know, it has to be done it has to be done and controlled locally. There is a, one example of, of that in this area. I know some of you are aware of the Couch and Stewardship Water Roundtable. Uh, it is a group of many organizations and individuals that have come together to to work at making this system more healthy. And a lot of us have put aside our differences and, and dealt with some, some pretty major problems in this watershed and have some remarkable achievements that, that we are all proud of. You know, that was done successful with that group and, and Couch and Tribe is very positive that the Couch and Watershed will, will, will be the same. You know, we, we were there at the beginning of the process and we'll continue to be here because, you know, this area is, is the only home we're gonna have. Uh, we depend on water quality, water qu quantity, all of the resources that depend on the system. You know, we depend on it as well uh, because, you know, we are taught and we continue to practice some holistic um, processes with, with much of the um, environments around us. So in closing, just like to reiterate that Couch and Tribes is willing to work and develop a governance model that works for us in this local region. We do know that this is a, a huge task and that we need to work with all the groups in this area and that we will make a commitment to do that Uh, and as, as mentioned by our moderator that, you know, there are some legally defined uh, rights for, for First Nations and, you know, I, I guess if we, if we end up moving to that area, we'll, we'll take that direction. Uh, but, but, you know, that's, that's not on the table for discussion at this, this point. But along with that, 
I think each of the groups and, and Cowichan tribes, you know, we're, we're looking for the, the respect that, that's deserved, um, the acknowledgement that, you know, we are here to, to make things right and to sustain the environment and, and, and to um, deal with some of the things that were done not correctly over the years. So we look forward to working with all the groups in this area. And as mentioned, we do look forward to having some discussions with a number of the other groups that are in this process as well. Uh, you know, we all can learn from one another and and I, I think if we all send one message, that definitely is going to go a lot further than you know, one group sending a message to wherever it needs to go to. So again, thank you all for coming to the Couch and Territory. And I look forward to more discussions with all of you. Heights Abka. Next, we're going to invite uh, Dina Machen, and uh, Dina is the uh, First Nation, she works for the First Nation Fisheries Council of British Columbia uh, as their strategic development manager, uh, which means she does a little bit of everything, uh, but she's mainly focused on fisheries policy in areas of co-management, joint management regarding First Nation uh, harvesting rights and uh, salmon management. Um, that being said, I just wanted to share a little bit more about Dina. Dina's, um, an Okanagan uh, Nation member as well and so I've known Dina for, for quite some time um, especially in her capacity she used to work for the for our nation uh, leading up our fisheries department and uh, she had a huge uh, leading role in bringing back our sockeye back to the Okanagan um, back when in the beginning days so I just wanted to to acknowledge the good work that she's done um, for us uh, so welcome Dina. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dina Mason, as Carrie said, from the, uh, the Okanagan Nation in Vernon. Um, I'm a substitute on the agenda for Dan Smith, because Dan phoned me and said uh, on Friday he was called away to a meeting, so I said I would sub in for him. But I see he popped into the back. So, uh, Dan, if you want to take the floor, I hate doing presentations and public speaking, so if you want to take your spot back, I'm, I'm willing to, uh, uh, to bow gracefully to one of my elders. Um, so thanks for, for having me. I'm, I'm actually kind of responsible, I think, for why we're having the session at, uh, at the conference this year. Um, lots of times when I go out to meetings, uh, I just feel I spend my life in, in meetings, going from meeting to meeting to meeting. And lots of times I'm uh, one of the only Aboriginal people in the room. Uh, most of the time I'm one of the youngest people in the room. And a lot of the time, I'm one of the only women in the room. Um, and I get very uncomfortable kind of being put in those situations where, you know, like you're the Aboriginal, so you get all the questions about Aboriginal rights and title and, and legal issues. And this is actually a really uncomfortable topic for me to, to speak about um, because I don't have that legal background. Um, so, you know, as First Nations people, we take our, our rights and responsibilities very seriously. So I'm always worried about kind of screwing something up and giving <laughs> people bad information or bad advice. Uh, so luckily when I was putting this together, I had some um, resources at my disposal from um, our legal team that assists uh, the Fisheries Council. So hopefully I'm giving you some right information and I'll be able to uh, direct you to uh, a place where if you're interested in finding out a little bit more, uh, we can do that. And I see that the regional chief is here today and she'll be giving a, a lunchtime address. So hopefully if I screw up, she'll be able to, to make any corrections. Um, so I kind of wanted to start first. This is a map of obviously of British Columbia. And if I asked most people, you'd be able to generally point out um, uh, where Vanderhoof is or where uh, Terrace 
is located or where uh, Massif is located, right? So most people generally know that if I ask that. So if I asked you who knows where Slave Tooth First Nation is located? Five or six hands, eight hands popping up. Splatson First Nation. So all the Aboriginal people in the room putting up their hands and a few people that work with First Nations in those watersheds. Uh, I'll give you, maybe I'll give you an easier one. Um, Musqueam First Nation. Oh, there we go, a few more hands going up. Lots of people watch the Olympics. Um, <laughs> Inkameet. Some people like some wine. Uh, that's the Isoyus uh, Indian Band in the Okanagan. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to have this uh, little bit of discussion, I think, about, you know, like we know a lot about Canada or a lot about British Columbia, but we, a lot of people don't know a lot about First Nations and their own communities and their own watersheds. Um, and they don't really realize how distinct um, and unique even in within British Columbia First Nation communities really are. So if I show you this next map, does that look like British Columbia? Maybe not as recognizable, uh, but this is a map of um, First Nation languages in, in BC. So it's roughly analogous to um, the 25, 20 plus First Nation um, nations in British Columbia. Um, do you know, how many people know how many municipalities are in BC? There, I had to look this up on the internet too the other day. There's 116 municipalities in, in British Columbia. How many people know how many First Nation communities are in British Columbia? More than 50? More than 150? More than 200? More than 250? There's 203 distinct First Nation communities in, in British Columbia. Um, located all over the province. Um, everybody, you must have neighbors. If you live in BC, <laughs> you've got to be right pretty close to a First Nation community. Um, so really, you know, I just want to kind of to stress again the, the sort of the disconnect, I guess, between sort of the Canadian society, British Columbian society, and, and our interactions with First Nation people. So this is why this topic of First Nation rights, you know, I feel uncomfortable talking about because it's not a conversation we have uh, a lot. It's not taught very well in school. I remember when I was in elementary school, I think in grade four, you do a unit on, in social studies on, on Aboriginal people. And I think when I was in grade four, uh, we learned about Mi'kmaq people or Mi'kmaqs um, from Eastern Canada, Atlantic Canada. Um, but there was nothing in BC curriculum about First Nations here in British Columbia. So, um, when we talk about Aboriginal rights, um, I think it's really important to understand where they come from. Aboriginal title and rights arise from First Nations' own laws and customs and connection to the land and their actual prior occupation of those lands and waters since before um, settlers came to, to Canada and to British Columbia. And these are what we call inherent rights. We have these rights because we were born here and so they're, they're in our blood. Aboriginal title um, is a type of right. This is a spe specific type of right uh, to use the land uh, and the right to choose how that land will be used. Um, an Aboriginal right is a practice, custom, or tradition integral to the distinctive Aboriginal group in question. Um, so actually somebody asked me to, to talk a little bit about this as well. So as an Okanagan person, I have specific rights because I'm from the Okanagan and that's where my, my lineage comes from and my family comes from. But that doesn't mean that I have rights in other parts of BC necessarily if I come to uh, the Cowichan tribes. I don't have the same rights here uh, that I have at home, or not all of the same rights. Some of them are very uh, specific to my territory and, and my land. 
It's also important to note that Aboriginal net rights are not frozen in time, um, but they're allowed to evolve um, so that the modern expression, I'm reading this one down here, I don't have it on my notes, uh, the modern expression of the right must be part of the, the evolution of the right and the logical natural evolution of the right. So rights can, can change and evolve and grow over time. So section 35.1 of the Constitution enshrines those rights in the laws of Canada so that the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are recognized and affirmed. But it's also important to note that the Constitution doesn't attempt to define those rights. Uh, a lot of that is done through, um, through the courts a lot of times. That's why we're often in, in court with the, the Crown. And really, Section 35.1 is the Crown's constitutional promise to Aboriginal people to work towards the reconciliation of existing rights and treaty rights in Canada. Section 35 gives constitutional status to Aboriginal and treaty rights. That's meant to ensure that they're protected and, and eliminates the potential for their unjustified infringement. So that means that um, the government of Canada, by its how it assumes its rights through the Crown um, can't unduly just take away rights of Aboriginal people because it has a policy or a law that says one thing, it still really needs to work with Aboriginal people to respect uh, and accommodate First Nations rights. So in one of the, um, the earliest case law, earlier case law in the 70s from the Vanderpeet decision, uh, this is what the judge had to say. Uh, in my view, the doctrine of Aboriginal rights exists and is recognized and affirmed by Section 35.1 because of one simple fact. When Europeans arrived in North America, Aboriginal peoples were already here, living in communities on the land and participating in distinctive cultures as they had done for centuries. It is this fact and this fact above all others which separates Aboriginal people from all other minority groups in Canada so Canadian society and which mandates their special legal and now constitutional status. So you might hear about uh, Canada's special relationship with Aboriginal people, and this is what this refers to as these rights, inherent rights um, that First Nations have, Aboriginal people have in Canada. <coughs> so we know these rights exist. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're recognized and accommodated all the time. So I kind of put this picture up just to be a little bit cheeky. Um, you know, we can't, the government, society can't afford to kind of bury their heads in the sand and ignore the issue of Aboriginal title rights because they exist. Um, so it's like little kids, right? So not dealing with the problem <laughs> doesn't mean that it goes away. They're still gonna be here. So you might as well kind of just jump in and start dealing with it. So uh, I don't know if I wanna get into this too much. Um, so Aboriginal rights are those not extinguished by a treaty or a negotiated agreement or some other Crown action demonstrating a clear and plain intent. Uh, control or management of a right through legislative action or policy in and of itself cannot be understood to have extinguished a right. So the Crown has a legal obligation to consult and accommodate First Nations in relation to any action or decision that has the potential to infringe their constitutionally protected Aboriginal rights including title and treaty rights. Um, so we've seen a lot of things going on over the last couple years with uh, Idle No More, a lot of the, um, the hearings around the, the Enbridge pipeline, a lot of First Nation communities um, very concerned about a lot of the issues in Canada and the, the actions of the, the federal government in relation to Aboriginal rights, so you've seen uh, it was one of the top media stories, I think, last year on the CBC, this issue. So it's really coming more to the forefront, so I think it's an important discussion to have um, because we can only kind of build a better understanding, I think, if we're talking about these issues um, and paying attention to them. So that was kind of like a layperson thumbnail sketch of uh, Aboriginal title and rights. I had 10 minutes to talk today. Um, so it was kind of a, a quick review. Um, but if people are interested in learning a little bit more, um, you can visit this website, UBC. Uh, I know we're kind of hosted by UVic and Polis, but I had to put in a little plug for 
uh, where I went to school. Um, so the indigenous foundations, uh, arts .ubc .ca, uh has a nice website where they go into a little bit more detail about the nature um, of Aboriginal rights in, in British Columbia and in Canada. Oh, I still had more. So again, Aboriginal title is a right to use the land and a right to choose how the land will be used. So this is where we kind of move from the discussion about the, the nature of Aboriginal rights and, and how they're defined to talk about, okay, well, what that means on the ground and how we work together. Um, so because First Nations have these rights, we take our rights very seriously. We take our responsibilities of those rights very seriously. So that means that First Nations want and deserve to be engaged in um, discussions about how the lands within their traditional territory is used. Um, so we have the responsibility to protect, conserve, and sustain resources for our current generations and our future generations. Uh, the ex to exercise and maintain our cultural practices. The responsibility to other First Nations as well, um, who access and depend on the resources, they're related to the resources in the same way that we are. Uh, the rights to harvest and access, um, gather, fish, hunt, um, for resources in our lands and our territories. And the rights and responsibility to exercise and maintain proper relations to the resource and its ecology. So this is a, actually a diagram that we use a little bit at the, the Fisheries Council when we're working with um, um, communities and the federal government, provincial government, non-native communities to kind of discuss how we see our rights and how we engage with the, the federal government, um, specifically on fisheries issues. So when we talk about First Nation rights, and I had said that they're connected to um, the land where we come from. That means that First Nations have their strength of authority and their jurisdiction is very high at their local community, but the further you get away from their community um, to say a BC wide scale, it's a little bit um, not, not as well defined or not as well understood. I mean, even First Nations need to work together um, because Aboriginal rights are very broad, but like Okanagan rights are very specific. Um, but the way that the federal government deals with things, the policies and the law is very broad, but how it uh, is implemented on the land, uh, on the landscape at local communities can be very different as well. So for First Nations, our strength of authority is very high at local levels, but when we're dealing with government organizations, the strength of authority is very high um, rests with the, the minister, and then the strength of authority sort of diminishes uh, or decreases um, the further you get to the land. So we're sort of at a disconnect with how um, we're working with local offices, um, local managers, area directors of, of different um, federal and provincial agencies. So that's something we need to figure out how we're working together um, more closely in, in the watershed. So some of the ways this is being done, um, I really like the, the preamble to the, the Haida Gwaii Reconciliation Act, which um, was enacted in 2010. Um, is the, the provincial governments and federal governments don't want to necessarily deal with the issue of, of title. So what they've done with the Haida Reconciliation Act was it might not be wholly satisfactory to either party, but at least they've both acknowledged that each of the parties has, um, has rights. Um, I think I have that better on the next slide. So they both assert um, sovereignty, and title ownership, jurisdiction uh, over that land, Haida Gwaii, in the, uh, just off the coast. So Haida, the Haida Nation asserts that Haida Gwaii is Haida lands, including the waters and resources, and is subject to the rights, sovereignty, ownership, jurisdiction and collective title of the Haida Nation who will manage Haida Gwaii in accordance with its laws, policies, customs, and traditions. And British Columbia says that it asserts that Haida Gwaii is crown land and it belongs to the Queen, subject to certain private rights or interests and the subject to the sovereignty of Her Majesty the Queen and the legislative jurisdiction of the Parliament of Canada and the legislature of the province of British Columbia. So 
I'm just going to go back. So when you read some of the whereas statements from the preamble of the, the Haida Re Reconciliation Act, uh, it kind of sets aside the question of title for now. I think that's what they're, uh, the parties are working towards. But the act gives them a way that they can start interacting with each other um, to do these things, the development of a new relationship between the Haida Nation and the province of British Columbia, an incremental step in the process of reconciliation, um, the, the process and intended by the Haida Nation in BC to guide joint decision making regarding land and natural resource management, provides for the commitment of the parties to further refine and develop the processes for operational level decision making on Haida Gwaii. So there are ways that we can learn to work together um, as communities, um, Aboriginal communities, non-native non communities, um, while we're still kind of keeping pressure on the government and the government of Canada uh, to work to uh, address and accommodate Aboriginal title and rights. So I love the internet, you can find anything on the internet. So I went looking for like the most complicated process, I, could, I don't even know what this is supposed to be for. Um, but really you could kind of like pop into here, um, Government of Canada, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Province of BC, uh, Ministry of, well they've changed it since I was working in the Okanagan Flynn Row, Ministry of Forest Lands, something or other, operations. Uh, local governments, First Nation governments, um, so it's really daunting when you look at these things and you're trying to figure out, you know, like, oh, where do we start, where do we begin, who do we work with, what do we know, what do we need to know, um, how do we start moving, moving forward. So it's tough, kind of like that old joke, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, you just got to jump in and start somewhere. So get off go, you know, we have the tools we need. Um, we really need to kind of get off of the sidelines. I'm a procrastinator, so I put everything off to the last minute, especially big tasks, complicated tasks, but it never gets easier. And the longer I wait, it's probably actually just gonna get worse, so I need to learn to kind of start doing things, doing things sooner. So get off go, get started. We have the technology. I don't know, does everybody recognize this guy? <laughs> Colonel Steve Austin. The six million dollar man, we have the technology to build them back up, right? So we have, we have tools, we have governance frameworks, we have uh, experts in the room, we have uh, you know, First Nations that have really specific uh, knowledge of the land that, we, that we're working to manage. Um, so we have the technology, so we need to kind of get moving and get on with it. So one of the work, some of the work that we did at the Fisheries Council in relation to collaborative management of fisheries was to develop um, principles for how we could work together. So there's sort of broad principles that talk about um, the recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights, um, the recognition that First Nations have jurisdiction and authority um, over their lands, that there needs to be meaningful engagement, consultation and accommodations of First Nations and their rights, and that actually we have a shared responsibility um, to work together to manage resources. Uh, we need to cooperate, collaborate, and help to develop capacity um, within communities to help us understand these things that we're, we're trying to work together to do. Um, the incorporation of Aboriginal and traditional knowledge uh, needs to be at the forefront of work that we do. Uh, conservation and stewardship really needs to sort of underlie the work that we do moving forward. Transparency and accountability, communication. The one I wanted to talk about a little bit more is the, the trust and relationship building. So without, you know, all this other stuff sounds great and, you know, yeah, we do have the technology, we can get things done. Um, we really need to just start working on this. Where it all starts is actually building that trust and uh, a relationship between communities. First Nations, um, are very used to, we don't have a great history with the, the government of Canada, with the government of British Columbia. Um, so it makes us maybe a little bit um, more wary to engage and it keeps us, you know, like we have these, we don't have these conversations a lot with people. And it's because we've been 
for lack of a better term, screwed over <laughs> a lot. Um, but we're willing, you know, like we're willing to be here as partners. Um, we really like working with uh, our local communities. I mean, you've heard lots of examples over the last couple of days where there's a lot of really good things that do happen at, at the local level. Uh, a lot of good work being done between local communities and with First Nations that have similar interests and in wanting to move forward uh, to address some of these things. But the, the trust and relationship building needs to be enduring. It can't be sort of like a one-off, like, I'm just going to go in, I've got this project to do. Um, we'll meet with some First Nations and we'll give them a little bit of capacity to do some things. Uh, but then we're out of here. We're only going to be here for a couple years and then we're out of here. Well, we're not going anywhere. So these, these relationships are very important to Aboriginal people to understand that we need to trust each other over a long time to be able to do things together, and it's not easy, but if you can spend the time uh, on the relationship for the first couple of years, like don't be so concerned about the process, but if you put the time into building a, a good relationship, that stuff kind of works itself out down the road. Um, so we have all the pieces of the puzzle, we have the, the tools we need and the people um, that are interested and passionate to work on the, the topics. Um, but kind of getting again back to this, uh, the trust and relationship building and understanding. Um, I mean, I don't know Stephen, I don't know if he said this, but it said so on the internet, so I'm gonna go with that. Um, that most people do not listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. So we really just need to take the time to understand each other better and sort of listen to where we're coming from and listen to what our perspectives are um, without really focusing too much in the initial stages um, on the end goal, right? Um, so really we just need to get off go and sort of jump in the water and take the plunge and then we'll all be in there together and we can figure it out from there. I think I went over my 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. I think you did an amazing job of summing that up for us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> our next speaker, uh, you can read his bio uh, in the program, but um, beyond the bio, I, I know Marlo from, from the Okanagan as well. Okay. Um, and he's, he's one of our, um, he's one of the most amazing um, resources we have for, for our water issues. He's done an incredible amount of research um, on water from, from the Okanagan Indigenous perspective and he has a wealth of knowledge to share and, and he, he always shares it whenever he's asked. We had a, a group of young people um, visit the region recently who got to sit with him for, for some, he shared his wisdom and some stories and I know our, our group from, from my community were ready to go out and march and protect their water after listening to Marlo so I'm just really happy he's here to share. So. Why in Chasqui one item? Uh, my colonial given name is as uh, was said was uh, Marlo Sam. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank the hosts uh, for, of this conference and whose land, uh, you know, I'm, I was glad to uh, come in and visit here. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the ancestors, you know, of this land and, and all living things upon this land that's here at this time. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm going to move this move that before I I'll break it or something. But uh, I guess, to, you know, to introduce myself a little bit more, I'm uh, a longtime activist, uh, in indigenous rights activist. Uh, and, and I also want to mention uh, before I start that I do not represent any political body uh, like the ONA, or I'm, I'm from the U.S. and a uh, part of a uh, member of the Colville Confederated Tribes. 
but I, I'm in uh, no official political uh, category that I represent any of them. So I just want to make that clear so, you know, I don't, uh, many times I, I get a little crazy and say things that, uh, you know, might embarrass uh, tribes or whatever, you know, but uh, them are all, all belong to me. And uh, wherever I go, I always like, uh, also want to make it clear and understood that, you know, I carry my rights, you know, like on my back, wherever, wherever I go on this land, you know, I, I carry those rights and, you know, they don't leave my side or they don't leave my back. And also wanted to make that clear. And, you know, as being, you know, and I think I have that right to, to do that because, you know, across this land, you know, I have, uh, you know, defended, you know, the Aboriginal and human right, you know, to exist on this land. So I just wanted, you know, to make, you know, to start with that. And I was here in this building, oh, four or five years ago, uh, sitting out there listening to all the things on water and maybe some of the same people were here. And I, I'm sorry that I was late. Uh, I had other commitments. Uh, actually, I was supposed to be teaching a class right now. And uh, I had made the commitment to this uh, conference a while back and I just, you know, uh, wanted to honor that commitment. So, but one of the things that I, I remember from the last time that I was here, you know, I hear some of the same things going on, some of the same stories being told. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder, you know, there's a question in my mind, you know, about how far, you know, how much progress we've made, you know, in, you know, in that last, since the last time I was here four or five years ago. Some of the same things were being discussed, uh, water management, uh, water governance, <coughs> uh, water quality, quantity of water, some of rights issues, you know, were being discussed. And uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, listening to some of uh, the presentations before me, you know, and, and I heard uh, the discussion on, uh, on uh, rights, title, uh, some legal perspective. And uh, one of my areas of uh, expertise and, you know, uh, my scholarship has to do with uh, looking at the oral tradition and extracting, uh, you know, what uh, might be constituted as the laws, customary laws and practices of our people as embedded within the oral tradition. And one of the things that really became clear is that uh, if we want to add, you know, the term ancient to these laws, you know, we're talking about, you know, going way back, you know, prior to times of uh, when writing systems were developed, prior to times when, uh, you know, modern man, you know, claimed to become civilized. You know, we're, we're talking thousands of years back prior to that, when we believe and we know that our people, we know we're living in organized societies, you know, following these laws and traditions. So it was nothing new to us, you know. And it's kind of, I'm really glad to come to these forums and participate in these forums because I can look around and I can see, you know, that people are beginning to catch up to us. You know, when, you know, when we're talking about uh, water management and water governance. You know, we do have a deep relationship with the land and the water for thousands of years. And when I see groups like this, you know, it's, it's really encouraging, you know, to know that, my God, they're beginning to understand. They're beginning to, 
you know, to feel what we feel about the land and the water, you know. Because we, like I said, you know, in many cases we have to stand up and defend this land and water. When I first came into Canada, I went to a place on a Penticton Indian Reserve called All Rock. The very first morning I got up and I walked to the north. End of the day, I came back. The next day I got up and I walked to the south. The next day I, following, I walked to the east and to the west. And that's, you know, following custom and tradition, you know, like I have to know my environment. I have to know the local ecosystems. I have to know where the water is, you know, which way this, you know, with the little valleys, the gullies and things all around me. So following tradition, I was maintaining and looking for a deep and meaningful understanding and connection to that land, a new place for me. So at the end of the fourth day, you know, I, I had a, you know, I knew where water sources were. I, you know, I knew, you know, lots about that land. So in the following two years, I slept on the land, slept on the ground for two years. I swam in the water system, the lake there, every morning for two years. So I come from a place of knowledge, you know, just in that sense that I had developed a relationship, a deep and meaningful relationship with the land from that particular place. And at many times, it, it, it's with great difficulty, you know, when we, when we as indigenous peoples are, are asked to address groups that, that maybe don't, somehow don't understand that deep relationship and what we protect, what we fight for, what we feel in here. And for one thing, another thing that we come to understand is that we are, some of us are land speakers. We speak for the land. The land, it has no voice as we know it. You know, that water, those animals, those plants, you know, those, uh, who was talking about 18 or 80 types of uh, snails or something like that. You know, they have a voice. They, ne they need a representative, someone to stand up for them. And I seen a man standing up and talking about that. That's a land speaker in my mind. So, you know, those plants and animals and the life forces on the land, they, they need that voice. And what's real encouraging, you know, we're talking about coming here, to looking at a, a, a method of uh, organizing people so that there may be collaboration, you know, working towards a, a means to an end. And, you know, myself, I'm real encouraged, you know, you know when I get to uh, address groups on water, you know, because I, I really believe, you know, that, you know, it, it is going to be a struggle. You know, it has been, you know, from the last time I was here up until this point. And I, and I admit that I've, you know, just recently, uh, from that time until now, you know, I was lost in, uh, in books and research and stuff. I've just barely, it's the first uh, time I've uh, addressed really any large groups, you know, uh, since I completed my dissertation. And it's something I just want to leave behind for a little while. You know, you put so many years into it, you just want to let it lay for a while and uh, pick it up later on and take a look at it again. But one of the things that, you know, we, we do need, you know, is that collaboration. And I always like to look at it as meaningful and deep understanding, and I really do hope and you know that at some point in the future you know that uh, the settler societies you know will will come to understand what they have sitting out their back door wherever you live wherever you come from that maybe you take that walk in them four directions a little ways 
and get to know your land. You know, whether it's an urban setting or not, you know, get to know where your water sources are, where they originate, where they come from. You know, we can do a whole lot of talking about watershed management and things like that, but I challenge you to know and understand your particular watershed. Go out there, maybe camp on that land, maybe, you know, bathe yourself in that water. And then you, maybe you'll have a different perspective on it. Maybe you'll come to a different understanding of it. You know, and you know, I just really encourage you to do that. And when we look at things, you know, I, I heard another thing here when uh, Dina was talking about, you know, the, the consultation. If you go out and you understand something about your land and whether you're in a, po a position of authority and power, because there's probably some of you are, are in positions of authority and power, that if you go onto the land and you make that connection and begin to understand something, something that you know, might be considered by us as being sacred, that maybe when you come under you know, your, the, the way the government comes and addresses our people when they're talking about consultation, generally they make up their mind and they, they, they just come and they're going to tell us what they've decided. That's their consultation processes. You know, it's not meaningful consultation. You know, we expect for our voices to be heard, and we expect to have, you know, some recognition as being the senior rights holders of water in this province. It may be different east of the Rockies, but I know in British Columbia, you know, we still are senior rights holders of water. We are not stakeholders. We do not sit equally at the table, you know, with municipalities. Cattlemen's, who the hell is a Cattlemen's Association? You know, what kind of political entity are they? You know, mining, forestry, you know, all these different stakeholders, you know, then, then we get invited to the table, you know, to be a stakeholder, no. And I always hear when I go to meetings and address and they go, well, what's wrong with the indigenous peoples, you know? Why don't they come to the table, you know? What, you know, you know and, and so I ask that, you know, there be, you know, a retake, that you take a step back and come forward in a respectful manner. There was a thing being put up on title and rights you know, many years ago when I first came into the Okanagan, I heard our, you know, the knowledge keepers talking, saying that there's no separation between land and water rights. And another thing I heard them say that I heard a number of our political leaders since that time say, show us your title. And to this day, we're still waiting for the province of British Columbia to show us how they gain title to this land that they claim is theirs. You know, Dina showed this thing where, where indigenous peoples were saying, the Haida people were saying one thing and the Crown was saying another. The Crown saying that they maintain uh, control of, you know, title over lands and resources. Uh-uh. You know, so to this day, you know, the government of British Columbia still hasn't, you know, stepped up to the table or stood before the people of this province and showed, you know, how they've gained title to this land. Part of my dissertation, and I'm no legal expert, but I had a, had a, had a lady that was speaking here the last time I was here, uh, uh, Ardeth Walkham, 
She sat on my uh, uh, doctoral committee. And I was really scared, you know, to have you know such a you know knowledgeable lady, uh, you know, whose expertise is in you know Aboriginal rights. She sat on my committee, and I you know did a you know legal analysis of uh, you know quite a number of cases, you know, in the U.S., Canada, and New Zealand, and Australia. And I was really worried. You know, out of all my dissertation, I, you know, she was the one I feared, you know, just ripping my, my research apart off. And at the end, you know, after my oral defense, you know, then I, you know, I asked her, you know, I was still kind of a, like a little boy, acting like a little boy, well, well, how was it, what did you think? And, you know, she said, well, it was good, you know, that, you know, there was no problem with that legal analysis, you know, I said, you really, you know, did a good, you know, good take on it. So I know what Dina's talking about, you know, about us not being experts. You know, we're not a lawyers, but we're catching up. You know, we are becoming more informed, and like uh, she mentioned that there was uh, the a group of young people that came seeing me I try to inform them, you know, and I have a lot of other, you know, students that uh, come forward and, you know, want this information and, you know, I like to share it with them. I, I send my dissertation out to, you know, all over the world, you know, hoping to share some of that to, to be a model. And as far as this collaboration thing, you know, I really, you know, put my hand out to each and every one of you. You know, like our, our friend here, you know, raised his hands to you. You know, but I do put my hand out and, you know, shake every one of your hand because I always think that there's always a reason why we get put in certain places to hear certain things, you know. So I really uh, thank you for being who you are and for taking the time to be here. And I do apologize for having to leave. I made, like I said, I made this commitment. Uh, I don't even remember when I made it, but I, I, I made it evidently. <laughs> and it's like I said, I'm supposed to be in a teaching a class right now, and I got another class on Friday. And so I'm kind of really behind uh, the eight ball on this one. But I did want to come and to and to uh, address you, and I just, you know, wish all of you a safe journey home, and, uh, and I hope that, you know, your family and your friends and everything when you get home are, you know, doing well, and I just want to thank again, thank my host here. Thank you. Thank you, Marlo. I just wanted to um, say a quick, um, say something quick to you before we move on to questions. That um, we talk about, I know it might feel and seem overwhelming, all this information uh, that you've been given, but, but the main piece here is the understanding. And it's, it's necessary to understand where we're all coming from at the beginning to be able to move forward in a meaningful way. So creating that deep understanding that Marlo talked about is absolutely critical. And so understanding all of these different concepts and being aware of them is, is so important. 